why. Uh, who in here has been in the Guard? Okay, who in here has been in the South Carolina Guard? Okay. Well, you know very well that a lot of our units uh, have, are named after Marion, Marion as men. Uh, so we're very proud of that in South Carolina. Uh, Bob, good to see you again. He's going to be in the presentation at the very end. <laughs> but uh, the reason I showed the video a little while ago, uh, the, the National Guard, is it, it's been around for a long, long time. Can anybody tell me how old the National Guard is here in South Carolina? I'll give you a hint. They were founded when Charlestown was founded. 1670. Very good. 1670. So for 338 years we've been around. When uh, King Charles or King Charles II gave the Lord's proprietors uh, the power to erect fortifications and provide the means for a common defense, at the, upon the founding of Charlestown, it was for a reason. Uh, many of you probably remember that uh, you know from back when you were in elementary school, the Spanish had a claim of all, of all of Florida and parts of Georgia. The Carolina colony at the time was, was made up of both the Carolinas and Georgia. So when Charlestown was founded, Charles II knew right away there was going to be a problem. And on top of that, there were a lot of Indian tribes that were not exactly friendly towards European settlers such as the West Oaks. Here in South Carolina, they were a very warring tribe. So that's why the National Guard was founded. The day those guys stepped off that boat, they started building a defense around Charlestown. It wasn't until 1774 that, uh, oh, let me move this slide here so you guys can, there we go. It wasn't until 1774 when uh, the Intolerable Acts were, were passed by the British Parliament, uh, signed off on by King George, that uh, people here in South Carolina really started to have a problem. <laughs> and. Uh, of course, that was on the heels of uh, the Boston Tea Party, and uh, you know, the, you know, the, pretty much the colonists have had a very mutually, mutually beneficial existence with with Great Britain. Nine of the ten wealthiest men in the entire country at the time were right here from South Carolina, and of course, after the Intolerable Acts were passed, you know what happened? Everybody started, you know, pretty much a, a shout went out across all the colonies, but. Uh, pretty severe here in South Carolina too. And here in South Carolina the big quote was taxation without representation is tyranny. And in response the First Continental Congress met that year. As you can see, uh, after that First Continental Congress met, there was a, uh, a pretty serious period of time there where you know, they, the colonists weren't sure what was going to happen. Uh, King George, not the smartest guy in the whole bunch over there in Great Britain to begin with. And uh, one thing that the, the uh, Provincial Congress did decide to do down here in South Carolina was go ahead and form a committee of safety. And the committee of safety started going out and they, they assigned the militia to go, the South Carolina militia to go do certain things. One of the first things was seizing Fort Charlotte. Uh, another was seizing Fort Johnson. Um, that morning, uh, on September 15th, that's when the South Carolina got introduced to the Liberty flag. A lot of you remember that uh, uh, my hero, General Francis Marion, at the time he was a captain who was serving under military, was assigned to go to Fort Johnson and secure the fort. And when he got there, uh, he found the fort pretty much torn up. The British, as they were starting to realize the colonials were going to do something, and they were going to do it soon, uh, the local, I mean, the South Carolina governor at the time, appointed by the king, sent his ship, the Tamar, out there to Fort Johnson with soldiers the night of Francis Mary and his soldiers going out there to secure Fort Johnson. And they, they took the gunpowder, a lot of the arms, ammunition, uh, out of the fort. And then, uh, of course, Francis Marion got there. Fortunately, the cannons were still there, so they were able to salvage the cannons. They just had to build uh, new cases for them and uh, reinstall them in the fort. But 
Uh, Marion was there, and that's one of the first introductions we have of Marion during, during that period of time. Um, the Hog Island Channel fight was another big event. Uh, that, was, that was actually the first fires that took place among the colonial militia here in South Carolina. A lot of folks have uh, pretty much forgotten that William Henry Drayton, uh, he was the president of the Provincial Congress here in South Carolina at the time, and he felt so convinced that he needed to make sure that the governor at the time did not make it up, up river to meet up the loyalists, that he personally made sure he was on this mission. And they went out there, scuttled uh, three vessels. They, they intended to scuttle four vessels. The fourth vessel ended up uh, getting getting moved out of the way by the uh, by the British. And uh, so they ended up scuttling three. It was enough to keep the, the royal governor from going upstream, meeting up the loyalists. He was forced to go back out to Charleston Harbor and sit there. Uh, another big event was the uh, Great Cane Break. One of my favorite stories, how many here are 70 or better? Could you imagine going out horseback, riding in the frontier of South Carolina, leading 2,500 men and uh, taking care of loyal, loyalists all around the, the frontier of South Carolina? Uh, that's exactly what Colonel Richard, Richard Richardson did, and uh, did a lot of great things out there, putting down the loyalist movement out there in the frontier areas of South Carolina. Sir? Yes. Many may not know that uh, Colonel uh, Richard Richardson uh, is from Clarion County, one of the pioneers, and uh, his uh, predecessors uh, furnished uh, six South Carolina governors, the Richardsons and wow. Manning. And uh, we were within uh, uh, 700 feet of the cemetery. Somebody may have gone there yesterday on the, the river road to the uh, Richardson Cemetery. Oh, right well, that's great. Thank you for telling me. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, um, let's see. For some reason, I think this thing's jumping ahead. Can, can you move me back one slide? I don't know if it'll, if it'll go back. It'll be like the back arrow. Let me get that for you. There we go. These little back arrow right there. Yeah, it's going back. There we go. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. I somehow I skipped over that King George slide. I hate that I left that one out. Y'all have seen his ugly bug before. It's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, of course, uh, the first shots were, were uh, right there with the provincial uh, president, Drayton, there facing down the uh, uh, provincial uh, governor at the time. Uh, it was, uh, at the time, uh, the Tamar was a 16-gun Royal Navy sloop, and Drake was on a, the defense, a 19-gun armed merchant schooner. And uh, it, it was just a miracle that he was able to hold him off. Uh, got past the cane break part there. Um, the next several months, the Patriots, of course, uh, were doing their best to make sure that they had good, strong defenses in the Charleston Harbor. One of the key points that, folk, that uh, General Moultrie kept fighting about uh, with uh, Major General Lee at the time, who was in charge of the Southern armies, uh, was the fact that we needed to have a defensive position out there at Sullivan's Island. He thought that was integral to holding Charleston, and he was right. Uh, when you look back now at the plans that, uh, uh, that uh, Clinton had and Cornwallis had for South Carolina, their main, the main thing they wanted to do when they attacked that first time at Fort Moultrie was to, collect, was to gather loyalist forces together, and they wanted to do that at Sullivan's Island. So it was key to their offensive posture to go ahead and get Sullivan's Island, then they would get the loyalists to camp, get together, and then they would start the invasion of Charleston from there. So Moultrie ended up being right. Now, <laughs> the funny thing is, as you can see, uh, four months prior to the British invasion, the, uh, the, the Patriots uh, began work on Fort Moultrie. So as you can see, the design up there in the top right photograph, 
is of what the fort would look like um, at the time, and that shows that two ramparts were complete. And oh, you look over there to the uh, to the rear of the fort, it was completely wide open. Um, because of this, uh, you, you had a Major General Charles Lee, the American commander of the South, saying that this is nothing but a trap. He said, guys, he said, um, the British get behind you and it's going to be a slaughter pen. And truly, had the British been able to get around Moultrie's forces, as you can see from that map right there, that's about as far um, south as, as uh, Peter Parker's ships were able to get to Fort Moultrie. And they've been able to get into the harbor, firing behind the fort, uh, the, the fort would have been lost. There's no question about it. And, and of course, uh, General Francis Marion, or Captain Francis Marion, was there with Moultrie at the fort that day. Now there were going to be two main attack routes to the fort, and the the one important thing to keep in mind here is that the you know Clinton and Cornwallis were bringing in a strong force. They had a lot eleven ships out at sea coming in that frontal attack against Moultrie and his men there at Fort Fort Sullivan, Fort later called Fort Moultrie. But they also had 2,500 British regular soldiers and Marines that they landed at the Isle of Palms earlier in the day, and their goal was to try to cross breach inlet to uh, hit Moultrie's uh, left flank. And uh, how many people have been down to uh, Sullivan's Island, Isle of Palms? I tell you, the first time <laughs> I went to the Citadel, a uh, little military college down here in Charleston, and uh, <laughs> uh, I've been a North Carolina boy of course, when I first get here, and I'm always, I've always been interested in history, so the, one of the first things I want to do is get out and know a little bit more about the area. And one of the first places I go to is, of course, Fort Moultrie. And then uh, one of my friends at the time, he said, man, why don't we go out here to Isle of Palms? They've got a great volleyball court out there. We can go out there and play some volleyball, so we go out there. And I'll never forget, the first thing I saw as I was crossing the bridge from Sullivan's Island, you can see Thompson's view from Sullivan's Island, looking over at Isle of Palms, is that big deadly current sign. How many people have seen that big deadly current sign? <laughs> well, it was deadly uh, way back when uh, Clinton and Cornwallis were thinking about crossing Reach Inlet there to it, you know, hit Moultrie's left flank. And uh, that ended up being one of the main reasons that uh, that, that attack failed there on uh, Fort Sullivan. Uh, they, uh, they had um, Peter, Park, Peter Parker sent one schooner over to try to shove some of the guys over there to attack uh, Colonel Thompson's forces there on uh, Sullivan's Island. Um, but uh, the, 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 the channel was just moving too fast that day. They couldn't get enough guys on board the ship to cross over. And uh, Thompson's guys were very good marks when they had the long rifles. Uh, good, you know, at the time they said between 200 to 300 yards. And they were, you know, every time, every attempt just got stalemated and pushed them back. So uh, that's one of the reasons that Moultrie was successful that day. One of my favorite quotes make every shot count. <laughs> we still believe that in the military today. Uh, the reason that uh, that's one of the famous quotes from Moultrie is because historians believe that he had approximately 28 rounds per cannon to fire at the British. That the battle started at 9 o'clock in the morning and went till nightfall. So you can imagine uh, how well you've got to be disciplined to, you know, fire certain amounts of rounds, certain amount of rounds when a time when at the time that the ship is most vulnerable to attack. Um, at the beginning of the fight, Parker's uh, main ship called the Bristol uh, had a uh, anchor chain down into the water. I got hit by one of our cannonballs and it caused the ship to sway to and fro. And uh, so that our guys on the uh, Moultrie citizen soldiers there at Fort Moultrie or Fort Sullivan were able to just light in on the Bristol. 
Uh, the two big ships that really got torn up that day were the Bristol and the Experiment. The, the Bristol being Parker's flagship, the Experiment being the other big, uh, big ship there in his, uh, his fleet. From the Fort Walter faced down Parker's 270 guns with only 31 cannons and a mere 10,000 pounds of gunpowder. During the fight, British gunners found momentary encouragement when they saw the fort's Liberty flag come fluttering down. And of course, everybody's familiar with the Sergeant Jasper pictures uh, that uh, become so famous over the years. A lot of folks don't realize, though, Moulter, after uh, Jasper jumped over uh, the, the uh, palisades there, uh, or embrasures, uh, to go grab the flag off the beach, as he was running back, all of, Mer all of Moultrie's men were cheering for him. They yanked him, pulled him back over, and then uh, Moultrie helped him tie the, uh, the, flag, the Liberty flag onto, a, on, onto the cannon staff. You always see uh, Jasper, but you never see Moultrie help him there. But, uh, this is one of those neat things. I, I like to look at pictures and compare it to the history, and it's it's kind of a neat thing to look to look at. Um, during the fight, Parker lost 70 sailors in both vessels, with another 130 wounded. By nightfall, the British broke off attack, picked up Clinton's forces, and sailed north. Fortunately, the majority of Parker's fires had bounced harmlessly off the soft palmetto logs, as we all know. That's why we uh, call ourselves a palmetto state to this day. Moultrie only lost 12 men during the fight. Word quickly spread throughout the colonies that uh, Britain's first defeat had come at the hands of the Palmetto Regiment. Several days later, our citizens would learn, of course, that the Declaration of Independence had been signed. Uh, how many people have seen that, that new movie, John Adams? Do you like it? Yes. <laughs> Excellent movie. I highly recommend you get John Adams. Now, unfortunately, most of the, the South Carolinians are kind of like downplayed. It's all it's all about the North, you know. Uh, but uh, the movie is a really good movie. It does do a good job explaining the time period and what was going on. Of course, South Carolina's delegates to the Continental Congress included Arthur Milton, Edward Rutledge, Thomas Lynch Jr., and Thomas Hayward Jr. thing that uh, the British did not do was waste any time allying themselves with the Indians uh, following the defeat there at Fort Moultrie. I call this period of time the, the counterattack, and the reason I call it that is because everything is about trying to rid South Carolina of the Loyalist forces, the Indian forces that had allied themselves with the British. You had several key four, key battles, uh, the Lindley's Fort, um, you had 88 Cherokee Indians and 102 Loyalists, some dressed as Indians attacked. They were repulsed by Jonathan Downs. You also had the ambush at, at Seneca, 1,200 Cherokees ambushed, 330 of Major Andrew Williams and citizen soldiers. Uh, Captain Leroy Hammond turns battle by leading a very, uh, a very valorous attack. How I many people are familiar with that? A great, great battle. Uh, they, they, they really and truly the Patriots should have been wiped out that day. And had not been for uh, Captain Hammond immediately rallying his men and charging the fence line, uh, a, the, the battle would have turned out quite differently that day. Um, he, he ran up point blank, started shooting the Indians, and uh, so frightened the Indians they started running away and we ended up winning that battle. The ring fight, another great period of, of valor. Who's read about the ring fight? Yeah. Ring fight, great, great battle. Had 185 Cherokee Indians ambushed Colonel Andrew Pickens and 25 of his men. He was out on this, uh, a, re a reconnaissance party that morning and there was a half-breed that was serving as one of his scouts for that, that mission. And some, some people believe it was intentional that this guy walked him into that ambush for the Indians to wipe out Pickens, we, we really don't know for sure, but uh, Pickens lost 11 men, but he took out 65 of the enemy that day. He had all of his men get into a, a, a big circle, and as it, the Indians also got into a big circle, started coming in on Pickens, he had uh, defensive depth, what we call, and he had two, actually two circles 
one interior circle, one exterior circle, and as one group of guys was firing, the other group was on, you know, reloading, and that's how they were able to, to win that battle. Palmetto Day, uh, we celebrate that down in Charleston. In fact, my good friend Fred, who's with me, we were out there with our boys this year and uh, had a great time at Palmetto Day. If you've never been, I highly recommend it. Take your grandkids, we'll have a great time. They have some great reenactors out there and they talk about the battle there at Fort Moultrie. But, uh, of course, the first time it was celebrated was the year after uh, Moultrie's great, great victory there against the British. Well, things are going pretty good here in South Carolina. Unfortunately, for the British, are not going very good up north. <laughs> uh, Clinton has just been handed a serious defeat at Saratoga. Uh, he doesn't want to risk any more forces up there. Uh, the, the, co the colonials up there in New York, I mean, they're just determined to fight. He doesn't want to go back out there in the open field and fight them. So what he decides to do, because he keeps hearing from down south that a bunch of loyalists will rise up and support the king if he'll bring them to fight down south. So he begins his preparations. Unable to gain a victory over the British fleet in New York or at Rhode Island, uh, Admiral the Count de Estaing, who was, of course, working with towards Washington up there in the north, uh, he, uh, he had hoped to stick around up there for, for quite some time and help defeat the, the British Navy, but that, that wasn't going to occur. So what he decides to do is sell south of the Caribbean, try to take out uh, some of the British strongholds there. Um, of course, Clinton, he decides, well, since the French fleet is gone, I can go ahead and move my fleet out. We can keep a, a small force here in New York, and we can move our, step, our forces back down south. In the first step of this operation, Clinton, the new commander-in-chief of the British forces based in New York City, dispatches a 3,500-strong force from New York to Savannah, to Georgia, to capture the town, as well as the nearby coastal cities. In late December 1778, the British force, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Archibald Campbell, arrives off the coast of Savannah and uh, discovers that there's only 850 uh, militia forces there at Savannah. Savannah was still a very small town at the time. Uh, December 29th, 1778, the British force marched into their landing spot south of the town towards Savannah itself. Howe led his militia out of the city to engage the British, but due to the poor training of the American militia and in inexperienced uh, type of uh, warfare that, you know, in Europe they had the European style of warfare. Here in the States we were pretty much used to fighting the Indians. And uh, so the, the militia at that time wasn't really well trained. And uh, in, in the European style, I should say. Uh, the, needless to say, the, the American forces there, they, they ran. They, didn't, they weren't used to that style of fighting. The British took advantage of the, this, opening up on the retreating Americans until most of them stopped and surrendered. The British took 453 prisoners while counting 83 enemy dead on the field. Only three British soldiers were killed. Quite a victory for Campbell. Their foothold in South Carolina established Clinton and Major General Augustine Provost, Prevo, I'm sorry, and his 2,400 soldiers were brought in from St. Augustine, Florida. And thus begins the, the march to Charlestown. You've got, uh, of course, the first big engagement happening at Grays Hill, Fort Royal Island, February 3rd, 1779. Uh, Moultrie, Mad Marion's there, by the way. Pretty much any time you see Moultrie's name, in those book, history books at the time, uh, Marion was there with Moultrie. Uh, but uh, they, of uh, course, guard his forces back. The next big attack is at Kusawachi. And the battle's going real good at Kusawachi. Am I pronouncing it right? How do you pronounce it? Kusahachi. Kusahachi, okay. Uh, but the uh, battle's going real well. And then uh, Moultrie decides he's going to let the very ambitious, talented, officer by the name of uh, Lawrence to uh, do a rear guard action against the uh, enemy forces and instead of doing the rear guard action what he does is he, he marches his men out there in the line in an open field without any cover and they, they, weren't, they didn't have the high ground 
and they get they they get run off the field pretty much. And Lawrence act, ends up getting wounded, and Moultrie continues his his, his uh, march towards Charleston. Uh, the attack, the first attack on Charleston there happens on May 11th. Uh, Prebo has, has marched his forces uh, within in five days from Port Royal all the way up there to Charleston. Demands that uh, uh, Charleston be turned over to him. Well, by that time, uh, Benjamin Lincoln, Major General Benjamin Lincoln, had, had arrived with his forces. They force Prevo to leave the Charleston area. He goes out to uh, uh, Stone Oak Ferry, and uh, he starts making a, a run for Johns Island. He's decided he's going to island hop all the way back down to Buford to get out of there. <laughs> he wasn't expecting Lincoln to arrive that quick. Uh, Stone Oak Ferry, that battle takes place on June 20th, and uh, that would have gone over real well had Moultrie been able to get his militia across the, the river faster, and that, that just didn't happen that day. And uh, Lincoln really couldn't force the issue. Uh, next one was Clinton lands on Edisto. Uh, that was February 9th, 1780. Of course, by that time, you know, you're talking 8,500 8, soldiers that he's brought down from up north, combined with all the other forces he's brought in from St. Augustine and also the Caribbean, and you, you've got a pretty good-sized army right there. And then uh, it's all leading up. He keeps moving his forces forward, keeps bringing his supplies forward. By uh, March 28th, he's got uh, a lot of his forces already aligned along the Ashley River, and he's ready to move on into Charleston, and he, he does. He orders the attack. Well, that's a kind of a bad picture of Benjamin Lincoln. <laughs> that's the only one I've got. <laughs> but uh, you know, in, in Lincoln's defense, you know, when he had, when he did have to surrender Charleston, uh, I mean, he he was greatly outnumbered, uh, outsupplied in every way, shape, or fashion. The, the militia was fighting a great fight, but the losses were just starting to pile up, and. Uh, you know, he, he could have fought to the last man, but uh, he decided to, against that. And, you know, he, he, he gets a lot of blame because that was, that was the army in the South. That was the army. And it was 5,000 strong. And, you know, that just didn't go over well with a lot of folks. But, you know, you know considering the circumstances, you know, it's, it's something he decided to do, and, you know, it's his call. But uh, one of the bad things that happened that day was he, he wasn't given uh, proper military honors for a surrender, and uh, he remembered that. And back, you know, later on, Cornwallis would uh, surrender at Yorktown. Uh, George Washington allowed him to go out there, and uh, he did the very same thing to the British that they had done to him in Charleston. So re revenge was sweet later on. Um, right around uh, the time that uh, the siege was taking place in Charleston, the militia was getting beat up pretty bad. Uh, they brought Tarleton in. Uh, Tarleton was a very barbaric guy, as, as most of y'all know, I'm sure. And uh, he, he uh, they, they just let him, they set him loose. He goes out to uh, fight General Huger. Hugie, I'm sorry, they walked Colonel Washington to Biggins Bridge in Monk's Corner. And then he uh, defeats Colonel Anthony White at Jamestown. And then he gets his reputation uh, of Tarleton's Quarter up at uh, Buford's Bloody Massacre. That's up in Lancaster, South Carolina. Uh, my old unit, the 3rd 178 Good Artillery Battalion, uh, the Truman's Ride Battalion here in South Carolina, named after Marion. Um, that's where we're from. and, and uh, we remember that and do a lot to keep that in the minds of a lot of people. That, uh, you know, here the, the American Patriots were, most of them, uh, good, good militiamen from North Carolina that had come down here to help Lincoln at Charleston. Uh, Tarleton had been chasing him all the way from the Low Country to Lancaster. They, had, they were just about to cross the river, the Catawba River, into North Carolina. Um, 
as the attack occurred, most, most of the guys threw up their hands to surrender, and Tarleton and his men just came through there and just, and just cut them down. Uh, had about uh, 113 Patriots murdered that day, another 150 wounded, most of them mortally. Recounting Tarleton's action at the scene. Yes, sir.
The battle was the first major Patriot victory to occur after the British invasion of Charleston in 1780. The park preserves the site of this important battle to this day. How many people have been to Kings Mountain? I, it's a pretty awe-inspiring to go there, isn't it? I, I love going up there. Several other key battles that took place that would kind of turn the tide for the American cause. Um, of course, Nelson's Ferry, the Battle of Kings Mountain, the Battle of Calpins, and all of them severely weakened Cornwallis' forces. They weren't considered victories by the Americans in most cases, but you know the, these little battles, these big battles, and the little skirmishes that were being fought in the back country and down the PD by Marion were all just a, eroding Cornwallis' ability to fight here in the South. His lines of communication were key. As anybody will tell you that's been in the military, your ability to communicate is one of the key aspects of winning in a fight. And more and more and more as time went on, uh, Cornwallis was losing that ability to communicate, and a lot of it was because of Marion. Um, some of uh, uh, Marion's victories and skirmishes that helped lead to uh, Cornwallis' defeat. I just picked out some, some of my favorite ones. Uh, one of them being uh, the Battle of Black Mingo Creek, and that's when uh, uh, he captured Ball's horse and he called it, he called the horse Ball and rode it throughout the rest of the American Revolution. One thing that you folks be proud of, uh, now that about two years ago we were having a big emergency communications exercise down in Charleston. And the British came over to participate. And of course, a lot of us that were participating in the exercise were, you know, with the 3rd 178. And a lot of us guys, when we got back from Iraq, hope, you, hope I don't offend anybody, we got uh, swamp box tattoos when we got back. <laughs> and uh, uh, what, one of these British officers just happened to see mine. I was putting a tent up out there at this exercise. And he said, to a tribe. Two and try. Where do I know that that, that name from? And I said, well, that was the the motto of Francis Marion's men. He said, that bastard's why we lost the American Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> and he was serious. <laughs> he, he told me, he said, in their textbooks there in Great Britain, they teach Marion's one of the main reasons they lost the American Revolution. So. Another source of pride for me is I was sitting there putting up that tent that day, and I was like, that's cool. Of course, a lot of people can say the final coup de, coup de gras for uh, Cornwallis was the battle at Utah Springs. A great, great battle. Uh, I take my kids by there usually about once a year, sometimes twice a year and uh, like to walk the ground and they, they keep doing more and more to, to make the place nicer and put more signs up and stuff like that.